Hi everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar on becoming a sports lawyer starting out. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean Cottrell, the CEO and founder of Law in Sport. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar. For those of you who have had the pleasure of doing Zoom webinars uh, over the last few months, uh, you know that it takes a bit of time for everyone to log in. So we're just going to give a moment for everyone to do before I hand over to our fantastic speakers for today. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of Law in Sport. We're proud to support our speakers today in organizing this. And the purpose behind this event is to not only just share knowledge, but also to create a forum where you guys can ask questions and participate. So if you're not familiar with Zoom, if you look underneath your window or below, the below your window, um, on the Zoom panel, not your, your house or your, <laughs> your office. Uh, there's a Q&A part that's there. You click on that Q&A button, you can ask questions there. You can also raise your hands. So if you raise your hands, we can turn your <coughs> microphone on. Of course, if you feel more comfortable to type your question out and then you do want to speak as well, just indicate to us that you want to speak so we know how to do that. Today's session is going to be awesome. I'm sure it will be. Uh, I know what's coming and it's going to be fantastic. I hope you find it useful. Please feel free to ask questions. As I said, there's no such thing as a stupid question apart from the one that you don't ask. So please go, go ahead with that. And normally once you ask a question, it encourages others to do the same. The topics for today, we're going to cover on, obviously we're going to find out from the speakers about their careers, their background, their journey, but also we're going to touch on networking, the industry in general, mentoring, both for the law and sport mentoring scheme and more broadly with mentoring. We're going to talk about how to write articles and blogs, the characteristics you need to be successful in sports law or the speakers perceived to be successful in sports law and education and courses, all of which I hope will be very helpful to you. So other than that, I'm going to hand over to Emily. Emily, over to Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean, and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to come and listen today. Um, so, yeah, my name's Emily. I'm a current fourth seat trainee at Shoesmiths. Um, I originally uh, did my undergraduate degree at Loughborough, studying sport and exercise science. Um, attended some law and sport uh, uh, conferences and, and met Sean that way, and then actually converted my degree to. Um, the graduate diploma in law and then sort of the LPC straight afterwards um, and then from the LPC I went straight into Shoesmiths um, and uh, I've done property litigation seat uh, and two commercial seats with comments in there as well so um, hopefully more come out throughout the webinar but I'll pass over to uh, Rustam. Thanks for that Emily um, and first of all thanks to you and Dan and goes without saying Sean for spearheading and supporting this initiative um, by way of introduction, I'm Rustam. Um, I'm an Indian qualified lawyer, currently working with, um, with Sean and the rest of the team at Law and Sport. Um, I've been fascinated by law, law, sports law ever since I was at university. Um, and in 2018, after about three years as an associate at a law firm in India, I decided to do my master's in sports law at, um, at ISDE in Madrid. Um, I've done a couple of sports law internships, paralegal ships along the way since then, uh, and I will be joining the sports law team at Mills and Reeve in Manchester within uh, the next couple of months. Um, so that's it for me, and over to you, Dan. Uh, thanks, Rustam. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, my name is Dan Kelly. Uh, back in 2008, I originally graduated with my LLB degree. Uh, so it was way back then. Uh, I then changed path. Uh, so I went into business development. So working with big brands in Europe, um, a startup firm in the UK as well. So obviously developing their business. Um, and whilst doing that, I was always looking at coming back into law. Uh, so I started studying my sports law masters. Uh, this was distance learning part time. Um, and I was working full time still in sales. I then graduated last year and now I'm working as a paralegal for the National Governing Body of Swimming, Swim England. Um, and yeah, obviously, more importantly, I was a mentee on the loan sports scheme. <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> so I think it's probably worth saying, um, well, to, to all the attendees that. If you've got any comments at all, you want to comment on anything, then um, please just put your hand up or type them in the quick Q&A. Um, the aim of this is to kind of open up conversation at, at kind of a, a junior level, so a junior level across professions. But, um, you know, we welcome conversation and 
insight from you guys as well. This is what this platform's for. So um, I think it might be worth just seeing, you know, where, what, pe what stages people are at. So if you are, or if you're willing to kind of say what stages you're at in your profession, then please kind of let us know and then we can try and tailor it as well. But I think in the meantime, it might be worth um, discussing. Uh, sorry, kind of Emily, sorry, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, Sean in the background here. Sorry? Um, did, would, you, would you want to just do a quick poll so that people can yeah. indicate? Uh, if you're if you're happy with that, we'll just do that now. Hope and forgive if we haven't put one of your areas in. Please put it in the chat if there's something that you uh, <laughs> you think we've missed. We'll just give you a minute to do that. And Emily, do you want to just carry on? Let's see, talking? yeah, fab. So then at least we can see. Um, so I think we were just going to start off with actually kind of the journey of where we've been and, and what sports law means to us. So it might be good, Dan or Russ, Dan, if you want to kick off with what does sports law actually mean to you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Um, uh, should I take that first, Dan? Go for it. Yeah, it's fun. Um, so, coincidentally, one of one of the I guess one of the events, if you want to call it that, that got me interested in sports law was actually um, back in 2012, um, the Lance Armstrong doping saga. Um, I knew very little about it that th uh, back then, um, but just you know the fact that you had this guy who was pretty much invincible through his career. Um, completely exposed and brought to justice, if you like. Um, and and it was it was at that time that there was an anti-doping conference where um, I, I bumped into Sean um, and met him there as well. So Sean, uh, well, lots of credit to Sean as well for piquing my interest in the area. Um, but, but, but it was really anti-doping that sort of got me interested in sports law to begin with. Uh, but since then, I've, I've learned so much about what being a sports lawyer um, would actually involve, whether it's the nuances of the anti-doping and WADA code, uh, anti-doping regime and WADA code, or the transnational football regulatory regime, or um, the role of the CAS, which in most instances is the final arbiter of, of sports disputes in the world. So, um, so yes, in practice, I would say sports law to me is um, the specific set of laws or regulations that governs relationships between sports organizations and sports persons, um, the examples that I cited earlier, um, uh, and hopefully an area that, that I can sort of uh, continue uh, on in my career. Right. Yeah, I think answering your second question, Emily, what is sports law? Um, it's funny, when I was studying it, people like family and friends were asking, well, what is that? <laughs> Why are you doing that? Uh, and I think their preconception was you're writing rules of the game, so laws of the game. So obviously it's more varied than that. Uh, there's so many different aspects to it. Um, but I, I agree with Russ Dam, it's really a sport and the law. So it's different areas and principles of law applying to sport. Uh, so that's my simple answer to that. Yeah, no, I think I, think I agree with that because, well, especially working in private practice, I think what I found is that there are areas of law which apply to sport as well as they do to any other, you know, the motor industry to retail industry, but then there are obviously sport specific laws, regulations as well. So I think from my perspective, I kind of dip between those two when I'm doing that work, obviously I'm still a trainee, so um, it's not, you know, I'm not doing that 100% of the, the time. So I think we've all got different perspectives in terms of our experience and, and where we are with sports law. And I think at the beginning, my experience was, you know, I just turned up to a conference of, of Sean's, it was un unscrupulous football agents um, back in, oh, it was 10 years, nearly 10 years ago now, and kind of didn't really fully understand the, um, I suppose what was out there at the time, but I was just interested in it, um, in sport, especially doing it at Loughborough, you know, we were always kind of funneled into that, but, um, and then, yeah, it kind of, it kind of peaked from there and, and how its application, I think is really interesting for me. So, yeah. yeah, I think, have we got the answers to the poll? Sean, I don't know if you can I see it. Here yeah, we go. Yeah. So, so we have a majority, well, not majority, but 31% of private practice lawyers, um, and a similar amount, well, I guess the majority would be students combined, postgraduate or undergraduate. Um, yeah, so that's that's good to know. I guess we can sort of tailor our discussion um, uh, based on, yeah. 
Brilliant. Glad, I'm glad there's students tuned in because if this was around when I was studying, uh, I don't think I would have went into business development. I think I would have pursued this more intently, let's say. Yeah. So they're, okay. they're lucky. <laughs> so in terms of, um, just to kind of move it on then and, and to kind of talk about our path to where we are now. Um, sorry, I got a bit of feedback then. Um, what we were discussing before kind of we, at points in our career we've all felt really uncomfortable and it's kind of learning to be comfortable with feeling uncomfortable and I think we've all had different elements of that so it might be quite good if we all discuss kind of our experiences around learning to be comfortable to be uncomfortable and what that means within the industry so far. Yeah I can go first if you like. So obviously changing career um, and studying as I went into law uh, I think I was uncomfortable with the fact that I felt like I didn't have the knowledge. So it was almost like imposter syndrome, if you like. Uh, I know we've spoken about it before, me and you, Emily. Um, yeah. Obviously, this, Sean, is uh, making us feel uncomfortable at the moment, I think. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a few reasons uh, why we're uncomfortable. But I think it's important to have continuous development in your sports or legal career, whichever route you decide to go down. What about you, Rustam? Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with, 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 with that sentiment and, and identify with the idea of learning to be uncomfortable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I also believe that, that, that real growth and learning happens outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, from my personal experience, just to give you an example, um, I first reached, reached out to write, write an article for law and sport about maybe three years ago um, and you know they suggested a topic for me I went through the editorial process um, and then it was published but I was when, when, when it was published I was I was quite nervous about it being published because a I had never published any of my work before uh, and b I didn't consider myself to have the expertise to be commenting on things so similar to, to what that the, the imposter syndrome aspect of it um, but, but, but once, once that was out of the way, that sort of gave me the confidence to write more and more regularly. And that's how you sort of, um, you grow, you learn, you learn as you write. Um, and, and, and you, 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 you build, you build a, a, a bit of a profile as well. And I would say this, this the same, the same situation um, repeated itself a couple of weeks ago uh, when, when I was helping out with the, the, the football law conference that just finished and shown um, encouraged me to speak on one of the panels and I'll be honest completely honest with everyone here I felt way out of my depth being on that panel of that stature um, so was I uncomfortable 100% yes you, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to take every opportunity you get until you are comfortable and that in my opinion is is, is the best way to to measure growth yeah, I think I think you just see so oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on, you go. Rest time you spoke about your your three P's. That's your uh, your motto. What, what were they? Yeah, I was, I, I was actually I was actually gonna I was actually gonna get to that later, but yeah, to, <laughs> I mean three the three sort of P's that I call them, um, and sort of well, I guess tips that I've tried to follow in my in my job search, etc. Are uh, patience, um, perseverance, and preparedness. Uh, you, you've got to be patient because sports law, by its very nature, is a very competitive and difficult industry to get into. So you're not going to get a job overnight. For s sometimes it takes months, for me it took years, uh, and I still wouldn't consider myself in the industry. Um, uh, you've got to be perseverant as well. It's, it's important to never give up. You've got mm -hmm. to keep, keep applying to, uh, to different roles, keep, 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 keep growing, trying to improve. Um, the other day, I was looking at at, at, at at a folder on my computer where I store like cover letters, CVs, and I, 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 it just hit me that I had more than 90 different drafts of Sorry. covers that I had sent out and easily more than 100 versions of my CV. Um, so that's that's just, just an example of how, how, how I was just constantly scratching things out and trying again, trying different things. Um, and finally, preparedness. Um, yes. People do benefit from a bit of luck. Sometimes you, you do need a bit of luck, but you you should be prepared to get lucky. Um, and I think I think always being prepared 
um, by by sort of like I said, learning, um, trying to improve, um, is how you do eventually get lucky. Um, I think with yeah. preparedness, you make your own luck, don't you? Yeah, you do create your own luck exactly. Yeah, and I think just on that, I think um, I think I've had a few different challenges, but just before we go into that, I think from a if we're going down the piece, I think proactiveness is really key as well because I think you know a lot of people within the sport industry, especially at the top end, you know, they are incredibly busy. And actually, it is very natural. And people like giving advice, people like, you know, telling you their experiences. Mm. And people want to give you that time. And, you know, there's a way of doing it. But it's about going after what you want and doing it in a sincere and organic way. And, you know, nobody's going to have a go at you for saying, Oh, I'm really sorry, I emailed you two weeks ago, you know, have you got five minutes or, you know, you've got to, you've got to, um, position things well with those individuals but I think you know there is an element of also creating your own paths your own olive branches um, and it's just learning tips and skills to do that um, and I think from so from my perspective being learning to be comfortable the uncomfortable I think from so when I started at Loughborough I, was, I knew I was interested in sports law and I'd, I'd be going to events and um, speaking to people and they'd be so experienced and knew exactly what they were talking about and could speak in depth and with breadth across so many different topics. And I think I found, so growing up, you know, I didn't go into the playground and all the boys were talking, you know, and, all, and my group of friends, they weren't talking about footballers and what happened last night in the football. And my, what I found my struggle is and what my challenge is, is to stay up to date and to know as much about the sports industry as possible. And that, I feel that that's quite key to be able to engage engaging conversation. And, and that's my struggle. So I have to really try hard to stay up to date with you know what's happening in basketball in America or you know ice hockey or whatever something that doesn't feel natural so I'm my background's cricket um, and a bit of football by with that so I think that was one of the challenges and also it's having the confidence to go up to people to go up to partners in law firms to go to speak to you know top barristers QCs to people within the industry who are at the top of their industry um, you know, not necessarily CEOs, but GCs and so general counsels, head of head of um, in-house law teams. And I think it's having the confidence to say, actually, I've got this interest. If, you, if you've got any work, do you mind me tagging along? Or do you mind me having a look at it? And actually, that's how you build kind of your network and your interest in the area. So you do have to get over that hurdle and kind of bite your tongue um, and kind of stand there. You know, you might stand there a bit like a lemon. But if you just say, look, oh, I'm really sorry, doing the awkward hello here. Um, does anybody have any advice because this is my current stage then nobody's going to turn around and say no we're not going to tell you anything so it's getting over that hurdle as well yeah I think don't be afraid to ask is yeah. uh, what you take from that I think that leads us nicely into networking mm -hmm. uh, so Rustam have you had any uh, challenges let's say when networking or have you been successful with it um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I've been successful net networking in itself especially, especially at a junior level um, can can be um, quite quite intimidating if that's the word. Um, yeah. Difficult to walk walk into a room um, of of, mm. of highly qualified knowledgeable people. Um, um, it is overwhelming. And I think I think just just to take a step back to what we were discussing earlier, uh, Emily added a fourth P: proactiveness. Um, I would I would go as far as add as to add a fifth one. Um, oh. In the P, but, but on the on the on, on the other hand, I think there's a fine line between being proactive, um, and this ties in with networking. Uh, there's a fine line between being proactive and being pushy. Um, and and admittedly, I I I I, I might have crossed that line on occasion earlier, um, but it's easy it's easier for me to say now with hindsight because um, obviously. And it depends on how the person you approach perceives you. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I never intended to be disingenuous ever. Um, mm -hmm. But 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 there, there 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 is there is that fine line. But, but and, and 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 you've got to sort of tread carefully. But at the same time, if you do make a mistake, it's important that you do you learn from it and then and then and then tailor your approach to yeah, yeah. I think to people accordingly. Definitely. We've had a question in which I think it would be quite good to answer now. So it's from um, Dragos Petku. Apologies if I've said that wrong. He said, hi, everyone. I just wanted to ask a question. I'm at the beginning of my career in sports law, so I'm not known in the industry. And I'm trying to form a network of clients. How can I pursue clients? How can I introduce myself to clients? So I think this leads quite nicely into the networking thing. And I think what you said, Rustam, about kind of not pushing it, not, you know, 
going too far. And I think also one tip that I was given, um, not by a sports lawyer, but by somebody else, is that when you, you know, try and go to events, try and, you know, just be around people that are talking about the industry. And actually, if you do speak to somebody, get their name or their card, you know, speak to them on LinkedIn and also, you know, make a note or fo follow up afterwards and say, hi, it was really lovely to meet you at X event. And then actually, when you go to another event, you might see them there and it gives you that chance to go and speak to them like, oh, hi, I spoke to you at the other event because you've remembered when you've seen them. So it's just a case of kind of taking it slow and building up your network that way. I think that's quite a key one. Have you two got anything? Yeah. Yeah, go on, go on, Dan. So my, when I first started studying the, the Masters, the Sports Law Masters, uh, the British Association of Sports and Law, or Sports Law, uh, have an annual networking event or annual conference. Uh, and it was when I first met Sean, actually. So I was pretty nervous. Uh, I thought I was way out of my depth going there. It was at Lord's Cricket Ground, so I was just happy just being there, to be honest. Um, sat next to Sean. Well, I arrived an hour early. I was there an hour before everyone. And Sean was wandering around, so got chatting to him. And it was just a, a natural conversation. Sean, I didn't have a clue who he was at that time, just gave me his card. Um, obviously became a member of Law and Sport and kept in touch that way. Um, but also at the same event, I spoke to a, quite a popular or well-known QC. Um, and in the last event I went to three years later, he came up to me and said, oh, how, are you, how are you doing? Where are you in your career now? So it, it kind of, you've got to keep putting yourself out there. You might not get that at the first event, but keep going. You know, patience is key. Rasta. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think Emily and Dan have covered everything okay. really yeah. well. I think I think well one 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 platform that I found incredibly useful and helpful is 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 LinkedIn. Um, aside from physical networking events, um, but 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 again, it's it, there's there's a fine balance between just cold cold calling, cold uh, reaching out to people. Yeah and, and uh, uh, actually creating meaningful relationships. So I would say really understand um, the market. Um, I, I feel a little ill-equipped to say this because I myself, are, I'm, I'm a junior, uh, but yeah, understand the market and, and, and know who your potential, cli potential clients are uh, and accordingly try and uh, look them up online, especially at a time like this where, where physical uh, meetings are sick work. Yeah. <laughs> with, with sports law, there's so many different areas you can go down um, I think if you know exactly the area you want to pursue that, that will help you so for example you, you could be data protection specialist uh, technology employment uh, focus on the area you want to go down and I think yeah. that will help. I think Sean, Sean have you got something you want to add to that um, it was just that, that uh, I, I'm conscious of the people who are attending that you've always mentioned like know your client very sort of like general sort of statements about know your client understand what you're doing um, I to what does that really mean though like how can you can you talk about in terms of what it actually means to you rather than that that broader point because that's quite a broad thing to say to go and research everyone when you're going there if you're trying to develop these meaningful relationships which has been key f for most people um, well, how do you just like say for example you're walking into the room right or you're picking up you're sending an email or you're calling someone how do you approach it what's your sort of like hey how you doing, <laughs> um, doing? my name is emily or whatever how do you approach yeah, it so i think it depends on the on the the person you're going up to so obviously you, you'll know you know what area of work they're in or what they're doing you know when we say client it could be somebody within the industry it could be a fellow colleague that you've never met before um anybody that's in the industry who you want to reach out to. I think it's worth, A, knowing a bit about them if you can. Um, you know, you don't want to start a conversation about cricket if, they're, if they don't have anything to do with cricket. They don't know anything about cricket. That's going to be a non-starter. So, you know, try and find some kind of convenient ground. Um, and I think also relationships are a bit more about just, you know, than just what people are posting and what people are doing as their careers. Get to know them as individuals and, and you know, you'll get to know about their families and what they're doing and how they're, coping in lockdown and actually it's having that more um that closer relationship to them and that's how you build relationships you don't build relationships by purely throwing articles out there and getting somebody to click like 
so so on that uh, would, before, would Dan before Dan and Rushton come in so what you're saying is it's not an exercise of just manipulation it's not an exercise of just trying to get something from someone you're actually Absolutely. engaging on a human level as yeah. much as you are on a professional level yeah yeah I think um in business development obviously trying to sell pitching a new client you you get into a comfortable conversation first uh, so I think that, that helps obviously but to answer the question, I think research before you go to the event, see who's attending, maybe shoot them a, a quick message saying, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to take five minutes, get a coffee and, and chat about your career or, you know, something as simple as that helps. Uh, yeah. that? And, and sorry, just, just to add in there um, and, and build on the point about sort of understanding what's going on. If, for example, there is, there is, um, there is a dispute between a club and a player in your in your area or your jurisdiction, um, um, and 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 you know and you know that you know the person at the club or the the agent of the player, for example. Um, it, it would be good to sort of read up about the dispute, what what exactly it is that's going on, um, how how and how importantly how you, you can potentially help if you're if you're thinking about developing business and and and, and trying to get them on board as a client. Um, what what exactly it is you that you can offer um, um, when 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 you approach them? Uh, I, I think just sort of knowledge of current affairs in that sense. Mm. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. And I think I've seen a few questions coming in on kind of funding and how they can access events and things like that. So I think it might be quite good to talk a bit more about the industry and mentoring and, and how key that's been to us. So I think that's a really good platform. You know, if you can't necessarily get to events or don't have the funds, there are things out there. So perhaps we can talk about the mentoring scheme and what we've got from it and what we've done alongside it. Um, Dan, can you want, or Dan or uh, Dan, do you want to start? Or? I can start. Uh, so the, the Masters uh, gave me the platform. I think it was absolutely essential for me to do that. Um, not only for meeting the students on the course, they were the high caliber students, um, but they also had conferences, like I said, um, biannual conferences. So you know, attending those at uh, maybe a discounted rate or even for free. Yeah. You get to meet these people there. So, yeah. So did you attend the free events and then sell, sorry, don't you know to say, did you self-fund the Masters or how did you do that? Because we've got two questions in from Jerry, uh, talk, well, from Jerry talking about practical strategies about attending them and how key funding is. Kind of yeah, I, I had to self-fund my Masters. Uh, I was fortunate that I could do that at that time. Um, but I, I think there are options mm. out there. Um, I think in, in England, if you're doing the LPC, you can do the, the LLM as well, and it finances the LPC. So you have got options. And I think with the current climate, you might find more options in, in the coming years as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, it was like kind of the, the mentor. So I attended, so British Association of Sports Law. Were they free, Dan? So I've been to a few of them. If you're a student. The ones at DMU were, yeah. So yeah, depending, yeah, if you're a student, you are. Um, if not, I think they're relatively um, low price. And then also quite a few of Sean's like podcast webinars. They're yeah. free as well. Um, you know, there's always options out there. And I think, so the mentoring scheme as well, obviously we all got that the, the first year and a kind of, graduated from it and kind of continued you know our network and, and, and moving on from that so and that's key because you're paired with somebody within the field who not only is an expert but has incredible as an incredible network as well and can introduce you to people and guide you and I think as well what comes with that and I found so I've had a mentor on the mentoring scheme and then another mentor kind of alongside it just because you know, he works with um, she smiths on, on a lot of work and we, we kind of linked up and um, you know could see the value in having a mentor outside of a, a you know a rigid structure as well um so i think there's that side of it mentors within the workplace are well they're really important I, i've been lucky um both the legal jobs i've had recently shout out to the senior legal uh council they've both been terrific for me so so yeah like, likewise I'd, I'd, I'd agree with, with with both you guys i think it's it's, it's essential it's essential to have to benefit from from mentoring, um, uh, whether whether that's formally through a men, me, mentoring program like like the Law and Sport one, um, or, or informally. Personally, I um, uh, at while I was at Easy Day, I sort of had many, I would say, informal mentor 
sort of relationships where 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 I built up a good relationship with people that came to teach um, and continue to stay in touch with with some of them um, without without explicitly saying that okay I will mentor you but but the, the relationship is is still the same and and in the same way at the various places that I have worked since then um, the the my supervisors have been fantastic all of them um, uh, and and have really sort of sort of well I guess pretty much help you through it yeah yeah through yeah. it so, so it's important to have uh, uh, me mentors at work and really make the most of it yeah bro and i think so something that's kind of quite key here somebody's uh, so rashali patel i think you said how to select a university for a master's in sports law so um i haven't done a sports law i am actually looking at the the practice certificate but i haven't gone down that route yet but last time you said you've done is day and dan you've done the other masters at DMU, haven't you? So how did you both select what was right for you? Uh, do you want to take that rest down first? Sure, sure. Go for it. Uh, so I took a, a De Montfort purely because it was distance learning. Um, I could study it online in my own time, flexible. Um, but also you've got to choose it for the, for the modules because if you're not interested in the, the course or the modules, then you're not going to get the most out of it. Uh, I studied it on the accelerated route. So instead of taking it for 24 months, I completed it in 15 months. Uh, I think that you got to have that sort of determination and, and well, almost obsession for it, in my opinion. Uh, but DMU has got a good reputation, so that's why. I think Mark O'Neill's just recommended it in the chat as well, so <laughs> they get an influx of people now, we know why. I've, I've met Mark there actually, I know. Uh, Have you? Okay. I think he's just as obsessed as me at the moment with it, so. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Rustam? Yeah, as far as, far as my master's uh, experience is concerned, I think I think it was it was a very big and important decision uh, that I that I took, and I, I, I thought very carefully about it. Um, are masters essential? I would say no. Do they help? Um, again, definitely not. Not like a magic wand. Uh, it's not that you do a masters and then you you automatically break into the industry. So it's very important that that you that you understand why you are doing a masters. Personally, my aim was to try and get myself a job within sports law. <coughs> excuse me, in Europe, um, and. Um, I thought the East Day Masters, physically being in Europe, um, as an Indian, I uh, I think many Indians who have logged in will sympathize with uh, the work permit troubles that we have. Um, I, I, that 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 was sort of it was sort of a means to that end. Um, but again, did it help me? Definitely, because I don't think I would have um, got the position I have had it not been for my masters. So. Um, I think for me as well, I was changing career, so it was absolutely essential. I uh, did some sort of legal qualification to get back into it. Um, sports or Masters was perfect for me. Um, yeah, it, could, it gives you the platform. Like Rustam says, it doesn't guarantee you getting a job in sport, but it gives you specialised knowledge that you could potentially use in the future. So going back to one of the P's again, patience, it's, it's there for you to build on. So. You yeah, can't get a sports law job straight away. Don't worry about it. It, it, it will come. Well, yeah, so, yeah, I agree with that. One thing, so, sorry, one thing I would add about masters, though, and this is purely uh, a matter of personal opinion, <clears throat> but I and so I appreciate that there may be other people who have logged on who have who have taken a different route. But I personally think it's important to to actually qualify as a lawyer and gain some experience. Um, if not your, if, if not qualified, then get experience, any work experience. Um, before you before you get into that masters because there's a lot about working being a lawyer understanding what being a lawyer is in general before you can actually benefit um, from the masters which which you don't actually learn at law school um, yeah. so I think that ex and it, it, in addition that experience gives you a certain maturity with which you can approach the entire process as well um, and and therefore make the most out of what you are um, I guess paying a lot of money for as well, which is which is a good yeah. Thing. I think I agree with you there because so I haven't done you know a specific sports law masters or sports law course. I did a module at, at, on my LPC on it, um, and I've just kind of learnt myself and tried to do some work. So I think you know if you really want to get into the industry, that the answer you know the answer isn't a hard yes. You have to go and do a sports law masters. You have to go and do a certificate or something like that. I think 
I'm considering it now because I'm just about to qualify, um, you know, into a team with, with sports law as well. And, and I think I think that will then enhance me kind of in the next stage of my career. So I think everybody's different. I think us three have, have shown that in terms of where they are in their careers and, and when it's right for you. So there's no kind of hard and fast answer. And I think with that, there's um, a question from Mario Cardet. Sorry, I'm probably saying these wrong. And um, said, I want to know, in your opinion, how much time you would have to spend doing internships or like a trainee to achieve a stable job in this, this short and hard industry. So, um, Dan, when yeah. you switched across, did you have to do loads of, like, did you do lots of internships or what did you do? I can go back further. So 2008, graduated in the midst of a recession. So uh, kind of mirrors what we're going into now. So at that time, I thought I was going to be a conveyancing solicitor. That's what I wanted to be. Um, and I was working full time for no money at all, uh, trying to gain the experience there. Uh, so if you can get it, get it, especially at the moment. Uh, but everyone's different. I can't give a it just a, a general answer is, yeah, if you can get it, go for it as much as you can. Yeah, I know uh, that Mishcon, so Mishcon Dorea, they were doing like a sports law academy and some yeah. of them are doing free webinars and stuff. So it's not just, you know, I've got to go and do a week in a law firm. Like, that's, yeah. the, that's the answer to it. And the, the mentee scheme or mentor yeah. scheme as well. But I think on that as well, the mentor scheme, when it all kicked off, uh, we had an introductory meeting with everyone. And one of the mentors, I think his name is Adam Lovett. Yeah. Uh, he gave spot on advice. He said, become a good lawyer first and then look at going into sports yeah. law. So, I mean, for example, with me, I, I had to get any kind of legal job and I'm still gaining as much legal experience as I can now um, because I'm starting again, so to speak. So, yeah, just try and get as much experience. If you can do the, the courses, the education will help as well. That's my advice. Yeah. Um, looking at the time, Emily. Yeah. Should we introduce one of the other mentees? Yes. Do you want to introduce uh, them though? Yeah, so Pablo's uh, also a mentee uh, on the mentor, Law and Sport Mentor Scheme. Uh, I believe he's a sports lawyer in Chile, but he can tell you more about himself and his uh, journey then to where he is now. Hi Pablo. Hi Dan, hi Rostam, hi Emily, hi guys. Hi, hi, thank you for joining. No, thank you for the opportunity to, to share my experience. I have listened uh, uh, carefully what, of uh, what you have said. Um, oh no. So, so I've just promoted him to a panelist. Sorry, I just realized oh. that they should be. So sorry, Pablo. Hopefully you yes. can now. Oh, thank you, Sean. That's all right. <laughs> so you could turn your you can turn your camera on if you'd like. Okay. There you go. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I got upgraded. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, um it is always a pleasure to to share my experience as a as a sports lawyer. Um well I can say that I agree fully with, of, uh, with what you have said uh, during this, these few minutes. Um, perseverance is a key asset, as well as patience, <laughs> much patience. Um, and uh, you have to be clear of what you want in the, in the long time. For instance, if you're like 25, 26 years old, and, or even 30, plus years and, um, and you see that you are apparently not going nowhere, you have to persevere. You have to continue trying, uh, knocking on doors, uh, asking, uh, researching, reading, all sort of things that um, eventually you'll get there. Um, my experience at least is that uh, I was an in-house lawyer for a professional club here in Chile for a year and a half, a very small club. Uh, which uh, got promoted to the first division in, in the history. So it was a, a very good thing for us. Um, and then afterwards, uh, while I was uh, working at the, an insurance company, which has nothing or very little to do with, with sports law, um, I founded my, my, I created my own sports law firm with a, with a colleague. And we had the opportunity to um, 
see contracts and image rights and uh, uh, work with uh, youth uh, football, uh, f uh, women football. Um, so it was a very good experience with that. And now after, I think for the last three months, uh, I've been working as an independent uh, lawyer, as a private practice lawyer. And uh, the, the, the aim is always the same, try to look for new clients, um, try to have uh, something to, with, with some, some, with some uh, substance to, in order to convince the client that you are the right guy to work with. Um, always with, um, um, li like Rustam said, not, not being too pushy because otherwise you'll get, uh, you'll, you'll make the, the, the client go away and find someone else. Always, always with respect, uh, with, um, with be very, very cautious with, with your words and the way you introduce yourself. I think those are the, the, the key elements to in order to to succeed or to get where you want to be it won't it most surely won't be now but it most certainly will be in the following years okay, thank you pablo so what um kind of what challenges have you had to face and, and what have you had to overcome um you know in chile or that you can see across the board yeah well here in chile we have a, a very very small market uh, there are very few slots available. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the interest in sports, it's always there, uh, but not, not uh, all the guys know what they're talking about. They think they know what they're talking about, but they, it meant in many occasions, there isn't. Um, so that's the challenge and, and you have to uh, learn more listen more listen to to other lawyers uh, ask um so make yourself just, stand out from the crowd it sounds like absolutely absolutely yeah. but in a in a humble way of course yeah. not, uh but i think the main the main uh, the main challenge here in chile is to create a market by itself uh it's still way way back ahead from from argentina from brazil even from colombia and uruguay mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Chile is, it has to, to stand out. Uh, and I think in the following years, it will, it will be, uh, uh, it will become the, that way. You'll get there. Great. Okay. Fantastic. Dan, Rustam, have you got any uh, uh, questions or should we pull in? We've got quite a few questions coming in. I think we've got quite a few questions. So let's, let's start sort of taking them. Yeah. Thank uh, you, uh, Pablo. That's really useful. And I think, um, you know, this is going to be a series. Well, hopefully, this is going to be a series. So, um, you know, we can explore different areas a bit more. Um, so, I think one of them, one of the things we discussed, and, and probably you, you all have experience with this as well, is we were going to talk about writing articles and how we um, how we feel about them. Rustam, you've already mentioned it that you kind of pushed yourself out there and you've started to write more and more articles. Um, Dan, have you? What's your kind of advice with writing articles? Have you done many, or you know, how do you feel about them? Uh, I haven't done any yet. <laughs> uh, I'm still busy doing my masters uh, <laughs> on the accelerator route, but yeah, d definitely do as much as you can. But I think there's a lot of people starting to write blogs now, um, so I think really you need to think outside the box. I know I'm I'm trying to preach, but I haven't actually done it myself. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, Dan, you have done one. Yeah, yeah. apart from apart from uh, the blog on the the mentee scheme or mentor scheme, sorry. Um, so yeah, just do the best, do it for a reason. Uh, but I, I think if you're going to do it, do it properly. Don't just do it half. Yeah, I think so. On that, I think I one of the main things actually I, I said to Sean, so as part of the mentoring team, said right, let's write an article. And I, I have co-authored articles now with um, David Murray, with some people from She Smiths. Um, but actually, when I try and sit down and write an article, I'm like, oh, it's like writer's block almost. And that there is quite a lot of pressure out there at the moment to get as much content out there as possible. And actually, really, if you're going to put something out there, let's, you know, make it be as considered as possible. And I think people overlook kind of, you know, it's really interesting. So on LinkedIn, for example, say that something gets posted or on Twitter, say there's an article that's posted. 
you know, even putting your opinion on there and, and putting something, um, you know, rational or well considered is also really interesting to read when you're trying to kind of read up on sports law and understand the industry. So you don't have to be going out there and doing like, you know, 2000 words, 1500 words, you know, articles. And I felt really uncomfortable with that. And I, and I flagged that to Sean that, you know, I didn't feel ready to kind of, I didn't feel that I had the expertise to be able to write a huge article on it. So um, I think just know kind of, where you're at and, and you do have to take that plunge you know a bit like Rustam said but um know where you're at and I think I think you know start tailoring start commenting on things start to develop your own thoughts because that's the way that you're going to eventually be able to write considered pieces yeah Sean mentioned previously about having original thinking so let's say you've got you've got to be slightly different to the to the rest of the field if you like at the moment yeah uh, and also just add, add that 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 platforms like Law and Sport are there for 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 people like us at at, at a fairly junior level um, to sort of if if we have something to say then 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 they're very welcoming uh, in terms of publishing. So I think I think that there actually has been a question. Um, sorry, while well, I just scroll down, um, Tiana, if I've pronounced that correctly. Um, yeah saying that Daniel Gee once <laughs> said if you need two articles of law and sport per week, it will help you in the future and you will stand out among others. How is it possible for young professionals to contribute in such a recognizable organization, example by writing articles? Um, <clears throat> I think if, if, if you have something to say, then 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 by, by all means, I reach out to people like Sean and Chris at Law and Sport. Um, and 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 they'd be very happy to work with you through a review process and and sort of have have that article published. Obviously, if it if 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 it's up to a certain standard, but um, I, I think I think um, uh, writing articles is is a really important way to to get yourself out there and build build a profile and a brand for yourself. Um, in, in I think Sean. Oh, sorry, I, I was going to say. I think Sean had a something he wanted to. Yeah. Sure, to interject. Uh, yeah. So, so I think one of the, the 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 challenges is to have an entry point into sports law. Generally, the level is quite high, right? Because it's such a niche market. That doesn't mean you can't contribute something, and everyone should have an opinion which they should share. However, it should be a our strong recommendation if you're looking to develop a long term career, is that you understand what you don't know and don't make assessments. So, the amount of time that I've we've got a recruitment division, and later on I can come back in to talk about the career pass some specific questions on that about recruitment but the the, the key thing i wanted to say to people is that there's a lack of diversity of thought in the sector anyway um there's also uh, in law there's a hierarchical structure so people anchor someone of authority writes something everyone just says yeah okay and then they just move on that creates such a wonderful opportunity if you're coming in afresh to ask those obvious questions of oh why are they saying that why have why are they using that term? Does that really uh, is that really true? Right? Have, have they actually read the case? When I got into sports law, I remember reading some cast cases, and I turned up to events, and no one else was reading the cases because they're too busy to read the cases. So immediately you've got you've now got an opportunity. So in that sense, I'd encourage everyone to start you know to to start expressing their views if it's going to add value as well. If it's not going to add value, if it's not something you actually enjoy, don't labour over it yeah. because you might be better off. You know, you might investing be better off time. spending your time, yeah, yeah, investing your time studying, yeah. investing your time trying to actually get work experience, or you know, um, so that was my sort of two cents on that. And I think there's that just because you can doesn't mean you should. And yeah. the other thing on the same point, be very, very careful about what you put on social media. If you're trying to develop a career path in here, say, for example, using a football analogy, if you start to bad mouth a football player, a football club, yeah, go down the list, and then you go to apply for a firm, they do check. You know, most, most decent companies, I will check social media profiles of anyone they're employing. And so they will see that. So you've got to be, remember that anything that you're putting out in the public domain, even at, uh, when you're starting out, has to be something you stand by in the future. And it also may, you know, if you're going to put it out there, just understand that you may lose an opportunity because it's happened to numerous people. And I'll hand back over to you. I think we've got, the other thing I was going to say quickly before I go back is if everyone's happy to, and please put in the chat if you're happy to, and I know I spoke to you guys in advance, we thought we were going to get a lot of questions. Mm. If, you, if everyone who's in attendance would you know, like us to carry on and answer as many questions as possible, we can overrun. It's not a problem. Um, so if you just want to put in the chat, if you're happy, if you'd rather that we get through as many questions as possible, um, yeah. then we can do that. And I've also got a couple of polls. Um, 
at any point, Emily. Uh, Emily right, should we run through some of these questions? Yeah. Should we go top to bottom or? <laughs> yeah, go top to bottom. <laughs> right, okay, so Tushar Katheria. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm rubbish at pronouncing. How financial planning need to be done for a sports person slash athletes as their career are unpredictable? Yeah. Any thoughts? Dan, you're looking yeah, like I'm... you're on that with the BD side of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm passionate about that. I think, all right, there's, there's agents out there and they, they are really important to athletes, uh, sports persons, but I think for life after sport, especially like with the current situation, is, is really important. Um, there are organisations out there that have really started looking at this now, uh, but I think, I think we could be doing more, is my personal opinion anyway. It's only a short career, isn't it, sports? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, speaking to somebody actually a couple of days ago, um, they play rugby and obviously they're under huge scrutiny at the moment with their caps and potential extension to contracts. Um, and, but actually what a lot of them are doing is having careers alongside, you know, their rugby, their cricket, their football, whatever. You know, they're le gaining courses and skills and things that means that they can continue coaching or they have different hobbies. So I think... You know, I'm no kind of expert in the area, but I think it's like anything you have to diversify your offering. And if you if you're kind of tunnel tunnel vision to what you want to do for the rest of your life, well, with athletes and sports people, that, that, that does come with a time limit. So, um, yeah, I think we're there on that one. So next one, uh, whereabouts are we? So Lucio, uh, is there a specific area within the sports law field where young sports lawyers can have more chance to be hired? And or there is more, there is more job offer, more job offers. Um, hi, Lucio, by the way, um, good friend of mine. Uh, uh, well, we, 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 we've spoken quite a bit about this personally, but I think for the benefit of everyone else, there, 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 might, there might not be platforms which directly give you a job. But just like I said earlier, with, with, with platforms like Law in Sport, which give you the opportunity to write if you do have something substantial to say, um, um, those really sort of help. Um, there, are, there are things like, for example, the, uh, the, there's an organization called the DRC Database, um, which, which, which basically uh, is, run, is run by Franz de Weyer, uh, who's, who's a Dutch CAS arbitrator. He, he, he basically runs this database of all, all uh, published FIFA DR, uh, decisions of the dispute resolution chamber. And what he does is, is, is has, has a team of young lawyers um, around our, our experience that, that he delegates um, decisions to, to summarize and puts, reviews them and puts them back into that database for practitioners who, are then, who then have cases before either FIFA or the CAS um, then refer back to that database. So, so things like that are good to sort of um, uh, enhance your knowledge while at the same time um, having something um, substantial to say that you're contributing um, towards your development. I think look at areas of growth as well. And like esports at the moment is going to explode. Well, it, it has. Um, and I think it, it will only grow. Um, so, you know, look, look at up and coming trends. Um, and like Sean said as well, Law and Sport has got the recruitment, uh, well, branch to it then, if you like. So don't be afraid to, to reach out. Yeah, real. Uh, another one we've got is, why is there such a huge gap between male and female sports persons slash athletes regarding remuneration or salary caps, especially in team sports? I think, I don't, think uh, don't mind me jumping in, obviously, from a, from a female perspective. I just think, you know, there's a few things... Um, from a kind of amateur level, grassroots level, you know, the pay on the way through isn't as great as in men's sport. Um, you know, the re remuneration that you, you get as a female going through your career is is much less than, than men. And obviously it is being balanced out at the top, albeit there's a long way to go. Um, and I think, you know, there's other considerations. Women have children and they're likely to drop off and that's taken a toll. And the fact that, you know, up until 50, 60 years ago, women women couldn't even play uh, football, so uh, joined the FA. So I think just in terms of history and the way that women have been perceived and, um, you know, the ability for women to earn money and essentially also draw in fans to stadiums to watch them play sport, which is a huge driver for revenue and salaries. 
um, I think it's developing and, and actually we've seen a huge progress in the last couple of years. Um, but I think that's one of the key things that I've found. Yep, yeah, answered that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, questions to the panel. If you're at a stage where you are unsure exactly which area of sports law you would like to specialise in, what advice would you give to somebody looking to get a broader range of experience in the industry? I think the answer is in the question. Get as much experience as you can. Um, that's the only way you're going to find out, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. It doesn't have I to be sports law, I don't think. Yeah, there's, there's, I think sport, sport in itself is, is quite niche and and at a junior level, at least I feel that, that it's counterproductive to restrict yourself um, for your overall growth. So um, uh, just sort of like Dan said, try, try, try and try your hand in everything, read a lot, um, and that might help in understanding what it is that interests you, and then you can sort of follow, follow that path as well. Yeah, one one of the main reasons I got into it as well is because I worked for a sports management agency, and obviously they deal with contracts all the time and with external lawyers. So actually, I didn't kind of, and that was just me um, actually emailing somebody out of the blue and then going over and meeting them and seeing if I could do any work experience in odd days and got into it that way. So it's not just sports law, sports law. You know, going, you know, if you can get work experience in terms of like BD within a law firm or sports management agency or any kind of even media agencies because. Essentially, they will sponsor sports teams. They have different aspects as well. So um, anything that's related to sport, I think is going to help you. Yeah. Um, okay. Another one. Hi, everyone. Really great information. Thanks so much. Um, Sorry, so this Emily. Is Emily Charlotte just conscious, Olsen. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, just conscious of time to, for those people who are booked in an hour. Can I just run a couple of polls very quickly? Yeah. Just as you're doing that, just because there's some important information that I think would be really useful to put into context some of the questions that we've had. So the first one being, uh, what region are you from? So it'd be really helpful to know out of everyone who's attending where you're from, what part of the world you're, you're in, just so we can get a, a feel. And then there's another question about funding and uh, your career development. So just be useful, indicative. The other thing is, um, this is, um, and Emily, maybe you want to talk to and Dan, particularly want to talk about this. Um, you know, you guys are leading the uh, uh, alumni for the Law and Sport Mentoring Scheme and being a big driver for this initiative. Um, uh, this is part of a series. Maybe I just want to say about that before. So just in case anyone else drops off. So there's more of these to come. Emily? Yeah, so there's more to come. <laughs> no, so we are uh, looking and, and we really, really want suggestions from you. So we're looking to open up the conversations for people within the industry. So not just sports law. I know this is kind of fairly law based, but you can get panelists of, you know, similar ages, similar um, levels in their career to come on and talk about the sports industry and just open up conversations. I found, I know I found it quite daunting when I was going into rooms of people and speaking to people who had, you know, who are really superior in their um in their career so we just want to open it up at this level and, and build you know build a network within within um early professional or junior professionals I should say so um yeah welcome recommendations for uh, other webinars to come yeah. um dan have you got anything else like mr no i, I completely agree with you and sean uh, let's keep the momentum going now and so we could see we've got a massive representation from Europe, as you'd expect, because of the time zone, um, I would imagine as well, amongst other things. Uh, and then obviously Africa um, being the next biggest um, down from that. And then I'm just going to ask us, because as it goes in the background, and then if you just want to carry on as people answer this, because some people have raised, it's just a, we're doing some stuff on diversity inclusion more broadly coming up. Uh, and so it's really helpful to know if you, if funding is, uh, you know, whether or not it's a real real obstacle it actually bothers us so law and sport is meant to be affordable hence why we offer free um uh, membership and everything we've done is meant to be accessible we appreciate that that what's in europe and other parts of the world is, is is vastly different um so it's something we're very conscious of um so if you can just yeah fill that out that'd be great and it's looking i can just tell you what's going on at the moment at the moment it's quite astonishing actually i think 69 percent of people are saying that they think it is a, a barrier to them developing their career which sucks if that's the if that's the truth, that sucks. <laughs> and it, it may be a follow up to this, Sean, that we could potentially put you know everything that we've discussed and all of our kind of thoughts and, and the resources we've used before into one kind of document or something. So we say like, here, guys, you know, this is what we use to kind of springboard and to gain you know exactly. gather our knowledge. 
So it's easy so, to find almost. And, and so for those people listening, by the way, striking the balance, as they said earlier, between being proactive and being annoying, these guys have been very proactive. And just there was it a great example of being proactive, right? How can you add value? How can you help someone, right? And they obviously want to help the wider community. And, and, you know, there's some benefit to them from a career development perspective. There's a benefit to Laura in sport for helping cert, to a certain degree with this. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but there is in terms of reputation and it's because of what we believe in is about inclusivity and diversity. But um, so I'm just going to share the results on that. So, so I just realized. Wow. That results, right. That's quite something. Um, so my point is, if you, if you feel like you can help and contribute to something, right. Sometimes it's not just about what you can get back, it's about what you can give and there's not going to be a return. And so that's from Emily and Dan's perspective, they want to build their network in particular in Rishtam as well. But, you know, just then you've heard, right, like they've got other stuff to do and they want to like, compile information to help other people who are going through the same thing as them. That's a wonderful illustration of adding value. Anyway, just we'll uh, highlight that as, as it goes. Right no, sorry, I've just had somebody in the Q&A say there's a bit more context with the last poll, so in terms of funding. So I think, mm. yeah, perhaps we can address that in another webinar. And, and yeah, I think you know, that, invite... maybe that should be a separate webinar in yeah, itself. Yeah, we can look at that. Um, because and I we've definitely... had lo loads of questions about, you know, where to do masters, the difference in masters, our experience with masters in the world. So I think there's loads there, and we could spend all day talking about kind of education, funding, masters. I'm not on uh, commission for Demantford, by the way, so... <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah, not yet, not yet. He, says, yeah, he says he says his next job his next job is being a good business development for the moment yeah. yeah. <laughs> which hasn't sold it um do you want to fire through those fire through the questions then and uh just uh, yeah i mean the questions so we've probably got 21 questions so i don't think we're going to be able to get through them all are we well let me run through and then let me do it well, i reckon we can this is a challenge okay so, right. 15, 15 minutes all right let's see what we can do okay hi everyone really great so charlotte olsen um, really great, Stuart. Thanks so much. I just want to know if you think it's important to choose the right place to in the world to complete a master's in sports law. So is the is the you know? I think I can. Go on, go on, go on, so quick um, fire answers. Yeah, so I think I, I think sports law masters are, are generally much fewer around the world. So you 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 are you it's, it's easier because your options are limited. I would personally say say Europe, maybe even the UK. Uh, just just because the markets are most uh, developed um, uh, those those areas of the world. Dan? Yeah, but I was going to say back in 08, I was looking at going to Marquette in America to do it uh, with Matt Mitten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Professor Matt yeah, even back then. I saw, yeah, so he's been doing sports for, for 30 years or something. So that that's another good option. But... I think there's so many variables. It's, it's on the, the person, so it could be finance, uh, logistics. If you're working full time, do they offer distance learning part time? We should do a separate. We we'll do we we'll do a separate webinar on this. The one thing I would say, and I put it in the chat to the guys, just to be clear, most of the top sports law programs in the world have law and sport academic subscription, and they base a lot of their materials on our materials. The top law firms in the world are our members. Uh, if you can't afford it, you're better off just reading every single article on law and sport and you'll become more knowledgeable than most people in the sports law sector, period. So if that's a real barrier, that's the 101 thing you can do. Like as in, yeah. you know, you don't have to have a formal education. I yeah. didn't. Um, no, I haven't had sports law. So. No, exactly. And there's a million other people who have, well, not a million, but yeah. there's many other people who didn't. So it's great if you can. If you can't, don't let that deter you, right? There's, yeah. other, there's more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. So Cinder Han... I'm glad you got this, Sean, because I already got this one. Help me on this one. You know I'm terrible with names. So that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, I think the approach, whether you're applying in India or anywhere else in the world, would be the same. Uh, and we've been through that. Um, there's, I guess there's, there's a lot I could sort of try and help you with. But if, if I guess if you'd like to reach out privately, I could uh, just, just in the interest of time. Yeah, and it's a growing it's a growing area in india but yeah. there's, not, there's not actually that many opportunities which is a big challenge, the number of people given opportunities but there are there um agreed uh alex gibson hi alex uh when would you say the best time to enter the mentoring scheme i'm just into my second year of university would this be too early no if you do a good application uh, uh, top tip john cullen our director of recruitment has talked about this for application for mentoring scheme applications for jobs please tell people what it is that you want like as in truly what you hope to get from it and how it's going to help your career last time we had to basically uh, uh, arrange calls with all the people who didn't get on but people didn't get onto the scheme last time round. a lot of the time they did they were great individuals that it didn't clearly articulate how they thought it was going to help them in their career path and career development and where it was going to go so alex it doesn't really matter you know, as long as you're honest about where you're at now and where you hope to go that you know you, you're always welcome to apply if there's enough spaces and if not 
you know, it's always great to, to see a good application anyway, and one for the future um, on that. Uh, Emma Godfrey, can the panel give advice on how to gain additional experience on the side whilst currently working with a different, within a different industry? I'm currently in-house as a commercial paralegal and have always had a desire to pursue a sports career in sports law i'm concerned that when i do apply for sports law roles i'm concerned i don't necessarily have the right expertise and ex uh, against other candidates and this is one that i got quite a lot when i was trying to do a training contract or trying to apply for a training contract because my career I, i'd done like sports law although i'd converted to law all my work experience had been within sports law i think i'd done one thing in family law and everybody was like well why 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 do you want to switch? Like, why do you want to go from sports to law? So I think it would be the same. Why do you want to go from commercial law to sports law? And I think you really have to know what, what it is as to why you want to switch and know and rehearse and be very articulate and very strong as to your passion for it and, as, and then demonstrate it with evidence. So you're part of law and sport. You, you know, you've attended these events. You've, you know, spoken to X, Y, and Z, you know, also, though, mentoring. Did, would you agree though as well, though, that, that, um, one of the things is if you can add value from your experience outside of sport, that's a great thing to highlight. I spoke to some excellent people who just yeah. totally under like, underappreciate the value they bring from not being yeah. in sport. Yeah, I was I was I was just going to say that 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 sports experience is always is is, is not always necessary, and yeah. there's like transferable soft skills that, that 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 you can bring to a career in sports law. Um, yeah. and Dan said earlier. Um, uh, starting out just being a, 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 a good lawyer um, yeah. is, is, I think, the, the, the foremost. Uh, I think nice. what you're looking for is continuous improvement. So be, become a good commercial, high <laughs> legal solicitor, and transfer it across. Um, Sam, Samson's asked how he can get notified of this. We'll email everyone out and you can basically opt in if you want to keep updated. I was thinking about this as we were doing it. I was, I was simultaneously in the background trying to set up a form and I didn't do it in time. So apologies. <laughs> we'll send around a note. I'll get uh, Amy, my, my uh, assistant, to send around a note and then everyone can opt in and then get automatically notified. Or wait, you can go to Law and Sport also and just subscribe to the emails and you'll get uh, notifications that way. Um, next up, one on mentoring. Anonymous attendee. I want to ask how you think it's best to get the most out of having a mentor. What kind of way did you interact? Uh, so, well, last time this kind of goes with yours. I think for me it was preparation, be prepared to ask questions, persevere, you know, ask for their advice, ask for their help. People want to give their help. And it was kind of emails, phone calls. It's about being proactive again, getting things in the diary. Yeah. A really short answer. I think it's important to appreciate that, that, that mentors are, mentors are often very busy people as yeah. well um so it's also about about um about how much uh, value you can bring to the relationship uh, as well and and and, and actually uh, making them want to help you yeah uh, they have to but they also have to to build on that you have to know how to help the amount of times that i've had to try and help people and they don't even know how that and i was that person years ago didn't know how i could help so the number one thing you have to be prepared for is someone says to you how can i help you that you've got some idea of how they can help because I, yeah, that's an awful feeling to have when you've got finally got the time with someone who's very busy and they say, how can I help? What do you want to do? And they don't know. And that's some of the feedback we've had from some of our mentors sometimes that they've felt a bit frustrated that the mentee hasn't really given any thought. And sometimes it's the obvious question. I, I need better clarity of this. Can you help me? I don't understand this. Just that alone can be good enough. Um, next up, uh, Tush, uh, Tusha, um, about the COVID-19, how's it going to affect the, uh, it's going to be a mess with COVID-19 is the answer. So everyone's still trying to rally around. We've got a whole section that's free to access on our COVID-19, uh, page on, on Lawrence Spot under topics. So you can check that out for more information on that. Likewise, there'll be, a, there's going to be a lot of, of, of discussion and podcasts and everything on that topic. Moving on, um, Apilasha. I think I've said that right. Um, I have completed two years uh, of work experience in corporate law firms. I have a growing interest in sports law. However, I have no prior experience in sports law. Um, want to understand what the importance of LNM in sports law? Should I gain experience in practice? Look, I'm going to. Can I take this one real quick? Yep. Doesn't. Uh, really this happen. was exactly my position, by the way. This was right. it for me. Um, you go so for it, Emerson. Sort of, sort of, maybe throw some insight on that. I, 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 I decided that well, three years of experience in my case was, was good enough for me to then take um, and, then, and then transfer that into a career in sports law by doing a master's. So uh, if you ask me, I, I think if you can get a position in a sports law firm, great. Uh, if not, I, I, I think this is a good time to, to do a master's. And we'll, 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 um, 
we'll, and again, it depends on your economic situation as well. We'll be doing a webinar with our uh, director of recruitment, John Cullen. And for, for background, we recruit for a whole bunch of different companies, prior practice law firms, um, like, like sports organizations like Mercedes Formula One team. Uh, we advertise job advertisements. And, and also a great thing for all you guys is, is committee members and stuff like that for, for sports organizations. Um, we'll do a separate, a whole webinar, I think, on that because that's a, there's no right answer again. We, we, we've, we, we've placed people who have literally just qualified as lawyers straight into sports law jobs. But it depends on the skill set that they had. And again, it's all circum, like circumstantial and also how good you are as an individual. Um, uh, here you go, Loughborough grad. Uh, Yuganesh. Um, hi, everyone. I'm currently doing an undergrad sports management degree at Loughborough with a keen interest in sports. So how can I shift from no law background? Well, uh, Emily, you're the it's person. Me. Yeah, it. literally. So I just got next to science at at Loughborough. Um, I got involved in like the debating society. I uh, tried to get into the sports and law. There's a sport and law module run by Dr. Saha Yilmaz, so it might be worth reaching out to him and just even going in for a chat with him. Um, they run the sports law event and I spoke there this year. Um, you know, they've got links to London, to the, they've got the football agency program. So there's so many opportunities at Loughborough and just within the actual elite sports teams as well, you know, you, you get in there and, and there's a governing bodies based at Loughborough. Dan, you're based at Loughborough. So, you know, yeah. there's so many people there. Just reach out to people and ask for advice, ask for help, ask to go in. Also, I say, I say to me, when you're a student in particular, get involved in the sport. Get involved, like volunteer, like is on committees yeah. and stuff like that. Get involved in athlete, if you're an athlete, get involved in athlete commissions, right? Get involved in being, doing secretarial sport for the societies. It's all very relevant and interesting. Next yeah. up, Thomas Horton. Um, would you recommend a sports law postgrad certificate or their... Um, so the postgrad certificate, for those who don't know, is based in London. So it's a very specific UK question. It's an informal, like happens every week in London. So what do you reckon the, the you can convert though, right? As I understand it. Yeah, you can upgrade it. They're, yeah, they're academic. Do the, cert, do the cert first, if you're asking that question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Just Eastbrook, I've graduated with a sports business law degree, as well as I'm currently holding offers from LM and Nottingham and De Montford and work at Wickham Wanderers FC. Um, following completion of my master's, do you think you have any idea about applying for a training contract in conjunction with the CQE? SQE, yeah. SQE, yeah. I'm, by the way, I'm massively dyslexic. Uh, right. People don't believe me, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in pretty much the same situation, Josh, to be honest. I'm looking at doing the SQE next year. Um, so it, it is cheaper to take the SQE 1 and SQE 2 as opposed to the LPC. Um, so I, th that's purely why I'm looking at it because it's cheaper. Um, so yeah, I, I'm happy to. I'm connected with Josh on LinkedIn, so I can speak to him. The other thing is like, look, look, the one that I call them, and I'm going to say it bluntly, and I'll say it because I can. There's people like you guys on this on this now, right? What I call the undeniables. There are certain people just undeniable, no matter what their background, no matter where they've come from, they are going to make it. They and I call them. We know them. We see them all the time, and they're people you just can't stop. And one way or another, they're going to get there. And I've linked in like Stephen Ridgeway's podcast. I've linked in Adam Lovett's podcast. There's a whole bunch of others where people are just going to push, push, push. So whichever way you qualify, I don't think it really matters, right? But you can, there's always a better way, but you may not have the option of that better way. Be, um, be patient as well. Don't, yeah. don't rush it. It's so got to be right for you. Right time. <coughs> Saskia Ealing. Uh, hi all, I'm sharing the thoughts. I have a specific question. I'm a GDL graduate and I'm very interested in working in sports law within sports dispute resolutions. I have a Swiss legal education. I'd like to know uh, if you offer encounter Swiss law matters. Yeah, yeah I can take that one. Yeah, go for it. Um, yeah, I think, I think as, a, as, a Swiss, as a Swiss qualified lawyer, you are as good as gold uh, in, in, in the sports dispute resolution market. Um, yeah. because the, 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 the demand for, for, for Swiss lawyers, um, uh, and this is, this is what I found while doing my master's as well, um, is 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 huge. I mean, they, they will they will they will always need consultation with Swiss lawyers on, on certain issues. So yeah, uh, definite advantage. I would Thank say. You. On on my masters as well as uh, the whole assignment was on Swiss law and uh, the court of arbitration for sport. So yeah. yeah. Um, and it's a shame way for a integral part of the discussion is the idea of being a, a sports lawyer. It's better to be a lawyer first. Yeah, we agree. Yeah. Thanks, Shane. Um, Jacob Tidy, do you have any advice looking for a job in sports law? For example, I'm due to yeah, law sport recruitment. 
<laughs> but there are loads of like you know check out football law football club websites check out fifa's website uefa's website check out uk sport check out all different places right and the other thing is use linkedin get in contact with people there's loads of you know there's this, you know there's a million ways we'll we'll pick that up in one of the next webinars jacob if that's okay with you but if you're not already i think you might be getting contact with john cullen um Hi, Jody. Uh, hi, everyone. You mentioned at the start of the discussion about writing articles, etc. I'll be grateful for advice. We kind I think of we've done on. this one. Yeah, we yeah, just didn't take an answer. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> uh, Rashali Patel, have we, I think we did. Can you help us telling us major requirements for entering universities for an LMM sports law? Guys, do you want to cover that off? Um, I, I think you, um, you, you just, you, you need, you need obviously a background in law, uh, strong academics. You could, you need to demonstrate how your, um, uh, you're, you're, you're interested and committed to a career. Um, yeah, and if, if I feel free to reach out to me, I've been through the process. So if, if, if you need any help, I'm always happy to. Yeah, awesome. I'm the same. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Uh, Jerry's asked about uh, recording the webinar. Uh, depending on how Zoom works, we're planning to put this up on YouTube, but depending on how Zoom works, uh, you should also get a link to that. The video will go up on YouTube. As I said, you can then click into, if you want access to, to other videos like this, you can do it. We're probably going to put together, well, I say we, Emily and Dan, and then I'll just basically tick the box at the end. Uh, and Rishdan will put together the materials <laughs> um, after this. Um, uh, Rashad, uh, Rashid, sorry. Um, uh, as an undergraduate student, what is the best thing I could do to increase my opportunities in sports law? It doesn't, like... Mentor scheme. Mentoring scheme. Well, I, I, I just think I just think have an area of interest. So, so again, it's a very, we we again it probably comes on to something else. But get your, not, your overall knowledge of understanding of the structures and infrastructure of sport. Would you agree? Like, yeah. In, not, yeah. I think the same, the same things that you would do as as probably a, a postgraduate student or a professional working in another job. Um, yeah. I don't think the approach should really change. Yeah, and if you're interested, depending on the sport you're interested, in, go to their go to their legal page. FIFA are, are killing it at the moment in terms of uh, their their legal information they're putting out. So much information, you could literally do a whole degree just on that. Just in the last year, there's probably a master's degree even. In, We've got a conference next week. Right, it's free, streamed yeah. live. There's so much free stuff out there just for, yeah. for people with basic information if you know where to look. But go to the legal pages, go to the disciplinary pages, go there on every website and then you know, reach out to those people. Um, Emily, did you want anything you want to add on that? No, I think... Okay. No. Um, as much material as you can. And when you're choosing modules, choose them on purpose, so like commercial law, contract law. You know, be, be uh, direct in your approach. And we've, so, uh, Abelisha... Asha, I think I've said that I think right. we um, answered this one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's answered. Yeah. CB, uh, from qualified lawyer to join regularly, right? The massive problems with um, this is a question about people outside the UK coming to UK. Rushdam, you know all about this. Do you want to just cover off that? It's difficult, is it? Um, yeah, I think I, I think it, it's it, it's a possibility. Yes, uh, I'm not, I, I won't lie. I'll say I, I will say that it, it has been very difficult and it's challenging. Um, but but yes, it's not it's, it's not impossible, and and, and they, there's there's no reason why um, with the right attitude and approach you 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 can't make it. Yeah. So um, and then again, a question from Olumuaya. I think I said that right. Um, yeah, how can we find out about this? Yeah, we'll go subscribe to Law and Sport emails. They'll be coming out more regularly anyway, and uh, yeah, we'll get everyone's email address. You know, if you consent, basically, once we email you out, if you consent to, to being part of the group, then we'll make you part of the group. We'll just take it from there. Um, uh, Gary Muriki, uh, I have achieved a law degree. Um, I work at two large sports stadiums in Melbourne, Australia. Worked at FFA in Australia and also... Did you... Australia is a very small market for Australian. Yeah, that, yeah, that's 100%. 100%. I <laughs> agree with that. But that doesn't mean you can't add value. In a, in a connected world, you can work anywhere. Like, yeah. like one of my, like, you know, you, you can literally, that's not the obstacle. Like, if you really want to develop a career, in my opinion, and again, I'm not sure, Rushdam, you're a great person to speak on this. And, and Dan, you were based in Cardiff, and I say in the UK, so it's easy to travel. <laughs> no, but I know, but my yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, across the bridge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know all about this, right? Locations yeah. not, is, makes it different, makes it more difficult and challenging. But it's not the big restriction yeah. no. that you once was. Agreed. Rustam, I, I think um, I, I might I might sort of disagree slightly because um, yeah. for me, at least, 
getting getting into an industry side of where I'm permitted to work, it was probably the biggest challenge if I had, if I had to name one. Um, but but that being said, you have to you have to acknowledge that the supply of jobs generally in sport is 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 much less than the demand for it, and 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 and, and therefore. Uh, like like Sean says, there's 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 lots of. I think I think with 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 COVID right now, uh, the one upside is that everyone is working remotely. Mm -hmm. I'm working remotely with Sean for with a four and a half time difference, and there's no reason why um, um, you, you should be restricted in that sense. Um, so so yeah. The reality is the people, the amount of people doing full time sports law work in private practice, not necessarily in house, but in private practice, is going to be less than two hundred people, I reckon, worldwide who do it full time. Well, yeah, but there's a really okay. interesting. Oh, sorry, Sean. There's a really interesting podcast, and it was when um, I was saying this to the guys. Lord Dyson did the salary yeah, cap Dyson, case for Saracens, yeah. and he said that actually it took him however many years, and he's still not doing one hundred percent sports law work in his QC. Yeah, Mark, Mark, Mark Avell, go down the list, listen to the Law and Sport podcast. I'll put the link to the, so you can check it out on the, um, if you haven't tuned it, it's on iTunes and all the other things. But check out to the Law and Sport page. You can just quickly scroll through if you want to. But like time and time again, and we've got hard numbers on this. Most people in, two, played to 2,000 most people doing sports law in the world, outside of the in-house council, so the lawyers working in, in, in Northlands, are doing it less than 50% of the time or less. That's, the, that's, that's so to put it into context. So if you're able to do anything, anyway, that's Gary's answer. Uh, Julian, um, mentoring scheme, it is running, but we're postponing it. We've got to do an update. We've been snowed because of COVID. Um, basically, it's caused us problems with short staff. So Julian, the mentoring scheme is going to be running. We're just moving it uh, a little bit. And we're going to basically do these in kind of uh, uh, as a join thing, in sort of kind of a quasi replacement as such. But yes, we will be doing it. We, we need to allocate some time to it but it's again it's a it's a pro bono initiative that we do so it's a free initiative we do and it's about resources and that's the so sorry we probably owe you an email response hopefully we're going to get to you next week hopefully <laughs> on that um uh, i find that the lawyer subscription is fairly priced but it's quite expensive for someone outside the uk agreed is there where to well if you're a student you get 50 full-time student you get 50 percent discount in terms of just uh, in context uh in terms of pricing it's probably one tenth of anything even equivalent of in terms of pricing in terms of so the backdrop is law and sport gives you the free access to those articles it's something we are looking at in regional pricing the blunt the blunt answer is people have exploited the, our pricing uh, and shared logins and stuff like that which prohibited us from doing regional focused pricing so unfortunately and i think like you said sean the value of the articles on there like if if all the masters if all the universities and professors are using the law and sport content then you know the price of a master's or the price of increasing your knowledge to get the job where you want to be i suppose yeah, it's got a way up value. as well it's, it's invaluable from that perspective it is, it is, but it's, it's, everybody yeah. is yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's difficult yeah it's, cra it's crazy it's crazy value for money like as in the genuinely we've priced it to be as accessible as, as humanly possible um in the, in the type of business model that we've having is something that we talk about a lot um appreciate that it's difficult we do loads of free stuff like this to try and help and, and bridge that gap. Yeah. Um, but always happy to take feedback and, and look at different things where we can. Um, I'm part of our diversity inclusion group. We're looking at funding options and stuff like that. Hence why I'm interested in that question. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, it. that's it. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. British terms details. Cool. Cool. I'm also going to take well, well done, Gary, on all your studies. Yes. Guys, thank you. So we get to 23 minutes. It wasn't quiet, but we got like, it was close, to, it was close to it, right? We got through them all. Um, so, guys, uh, firstly, thank you so much for your preparation. Thank you particularly uh, for Rushdam for stepping in on this and, you know, uh, accepting the invitation to, to, to step up and, and speak on this. Um, Emma and obviously Pablo for, for putting himself forward as well to give the, con, the, the, the perspective, which was excellent. Uh, Emily and Dan, thanks for driving this. I mean, it's amazing that you're doing it. I love the fact you're doing it. Rushdam, I love obviously your support involved in it as well and Pablo's enthusiasm. Thank you to everyone who's been listening and attentive. The questions, I love the fact that everyone introduced each other. Um, that was great. So thanks everyone. You're, yeah, it's really good. We're trying to create more community. It's needed at this moment in time in the world. It's needed in sports law. And this, this gap between the knowledge, between what you think you need to do to get into the sector and what you actually need to do is something that I'm hoping yeah, with, with Emily's and, uh, and Dan's drive in particular, they're uh, leading this and Rushdam now. I mean, Rushdam doesn't know he's been co-opted in <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to, to drive in this. So hopefully we can do a lot more. No, so, I'm happy to. I'm always happy to. Definitely. So, so if you did enjoy it, 
if you got a lot from it, please do tell people about it. That's the that's the power of it, really, is that people know about it. Um, and if you yeah, got any pearls of wisdom that you took from it, please do share it on social media. Let people know you enjoyed it. Emily, Dan, Rustam, Pablo, uh, thank you all so much. You're awesome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. And um, yeah, so what's next, by the way? So what's the next step? We'll, do it we will have another webinar, to, but any ideas that people have got, we have got a few ideas and obviously today's been really useful in terms of themes and things like that. So just keep an eye on, we'll get that subscription link out, Sean. And yeah, we'll So we're we'll trying to do something going. in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Like either, we can even yeah. maybe try next week or the week after, yeah. probably the week after just because we've got a couple of working groups next week. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right, guys, have a lovely day to everybody. Thanks, right See ya. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye.